I uh, see you chose to get in out of the heat and come in the air conditioning, and this morning we'll pray that the wind of the Holy Spirit also, I want to say cools you down, but really I'd rather build a fire under you, you know? <laughs> no, we're glad you're here. Good to see everybody, and we want to welcome you. If you happen to be with us for the very first time, we're glad you came, and we ask everybody, there's a little notebook comes up and down the aisle, if you wouldn't mind uh, filling that in, it lets us know you're here, and uh, if you'd give us your address, we'd like to send something to you in the mail. We won't come knocking on your door. We'd just like you to know who we are and uh, tell you a little bit about what goes on here. Just a few things that I want to mention before we get going. Next, um, 4th of July. So that's really a week and a half away. But uh, movie night, sub night, hot dog night, going to be a great time. And every year we do this on the 4th of July. We come in the evening at 5 o'clock. And uh, we're roasting hot dogs out there on the barbecue, and we'll also have subs for you. And uh, the movie that we're showing is a tremendous movie. Some of you have seen it, Paul the Apostle of Christ. I saw this last spring. It was an outstanding film. Sometimes Hollywood gets it right, and they did an outstanding job in this, so we hope you'll come. Uh, ladies, the luncheon potluck on August 11th, and I'm assuming... When can you sign up? Damn it. July 15th. What? July 15th. July 15th. Oh, you mean I, you can't do it now, huh? OK. Well, just putting the bug in your ear. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't want to be told that I overlooked the announcement. But yeah, OK, the 15th. But it's a special, really neat time every year that our ladies have in August. Next Thursday. At tw on the 28th at 9 in the morning, we have a, an hour-long seminar, Senior Living Options. Now, I know none of us are planning on leaving here. At least I'm not. But, you know, there does come a point sometimes in our lives we have to make some changes. So what are options that are out there for us? You know, when you're 105 years old, you might not want to live here anymore. <laughs> um, but what are the options? And um, we're going to have a seminar on that morning. There will be a little continental breakfast. It's free. We'd love for you to come. I think you'll really enjoy it and get a lot out of it. On the 21st of July, let's put this on your calendar, the Crimson River Quartet. We're going to have a concert here on a Saturday evening. It really will be terrific. Some of you remember about five years ago we did this, and it was just an outstanding concert. So we'll be reminding you more about that. Well, we want to begin our worship this morning, and I want to begin by reading from Psalm 46, if you'll allow me to read that. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, and she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in an uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, and the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come and see the works of the Lord and the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God, and I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Lord, today as we come, let us come to see the face of God. Let us be still in these moments and know that you are God, that you are not only our creator, but you are our sustainer. And the ends of the earth bow to you. Lord, let us be reminded that blessed is the nation who exalteth the Lord. And today, Lord, let your people here in this place lift up with holy hands the name of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Will you join me and let's stand together as we sing this morning. 
that first hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. This is one of my favorite songs. Well, you got to sing this song. Go for it, Karen. Go for it. <laughs> Please be seated.
Thank you very much, choir. We appreciate that. Got a little toe tapping going on this morning. <laughs> ah. Looks like we lost our G on serving, huh? You folks are lucky because you're here today and you get to view another episode of Caught in the Act of Serving. Folks, that's worth the price of the ticket to get in here. I mean, come on. You get a good song from the choir and then you get to, you get to view this. You know, uh, does anybody know what that is? What was it? Our library, stuck off through the, through the halls of this church, back in the back, through the double doors, two double doors back there, up against the wall is our library. If you didn't know it was there, you do now, and we have a bunch of books back there that you can borrow and read and bring back, some very good reading back there. People don donate them to us. And... There's a couple of ladies that uh, recently spent a lot of time back there in that library reorganizing that whole thing, taking out old books, putting in new books, cataloging them, organizing them, just all kinds of stuff. And then they had bags of books that they took out of there, the old ones, but they didn't just throw them away. They donated them so that other people could enjoy those books and read those things. Those two ladies, not a very good, uh, I was kind of far away from them, but Lois Keener and Pam Curtis are the ladies who recently spent a lot of time making that happen. Stand up back there, Lois, so I want people to see who you are. There you go. And where is Pam? Right next to you, stand up, Pam. Partners in crime there. <laughs> you know what? We just want to say bravo. Bravo. Thank you for serving. Well, not only is that worth the price of admission, today you get a two-for-one special. I was walking into the church the other day and uh, getting ready to come in and do a little work, believe it or not. And I saw this figure leaning over some shrubs out there, big old hat on, leaning down. 
And I said, somebody's serving, because they were trimming some shrubs or whatever they were doing there. And so I grabbed my phone, and I snuck on them, snuck up on them, and I waited for them to look up. And when they did, I said, smile. <laughs> well, I got the picture, and she said, oh, no, you caught me in my hat. <laughs> I said, thank you for serving, and walked away. That lady is new to our church, hasn't been here very long, but has already started serving and making an impact. Her name is Carolyn Conyers. Carolyn, are you here this morning? I don't see her. But when you see her, minus the hat, you be sure and thank her for serving at LHCC. And we just want to say bravo. Bravo. Thank you so much for serving. We appreciate that. Oh, by the way, remember I told you last time I'm not omnipresent, so I can't be everywhere? Grab your phone, put it on camera, and snap the picture and send it to me. That is my email, my cell phone number. You can text it to me, and it's on the back of your bulletin, right under my name back here. It's got my uh, cell phone number and my email. Send that to me, okay? Appreciate it very much. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. We got a lot of folks that are having difficulties uh, physically, and uh, we just want to continue to pray for those who have recently had surgery. Uh, Thelma's with us this morning in our service. Good to have you back. Uh, Bob Murdoch is home. Visited with him the other day. He's doing fantastic. As usual, you couldn't shut him up. Just you know, but he's doing great. And uh, continue to pray for, pray for Glenn Beauchamp, uh, for his healing. Uh, and he's here this morning. God bless you. And, uh, of course, Dick Schaefer uh, is going to go for another round of uh, chemo starting Tuesday, correct? Tuesday. Okay. He's, <laughs> he told me, he asked the doctor, he said, I made the mistake of asking my doctor if they get better or worse. The doctor said worse. <laughs> First one wasn't great. But they get worse, so God bless you, Dick. We're going to be praying for you, man. And uh, Kay Stitt, she's uh, continuing to uh, recover from her uh, fall with her shoulder and her upper arm. So um, we'll pray for her. And also, uh, Pastor Mike mentioned to me just a few minutes ago that Veronica Torres had a minor stroke. And uh, she's at the uh, Sutter Rehab. And hopefully... <coughs> We'll be able to get home on Wednesday. So let's, let's lift her up also. Also, we want to pray, you know, for all of our uh, missionaries and our military and all that kind of stuff. So let's pray. Father, thank you once again for the opportunity to be here and to lift our voices and our hearts to you this morning. And Father, it's, it's fun to tap our toes and hear some good music and and uh, thank those who serve in our church. But, Father, we also have an obligation to pray for those who are sick and who have gone through surgeries and are healing. And, Father, we, we lift all of them up. We mention their names, and there's a whole lot more on that list on the back of our bulletin. We pray that you would be with all of those folks that are, that are mentioned and ones that we may not even know about. We want to pray for the people in our military, keep them safe as they're away from their loved ones. Pray for our missionaries this morning, Father, as they're scattered throughout our community and throughout the world. And Father, as we get ready to uh, take up our offering and, Father, uh, get the money that uh, people are generously uh, giving out of the kindness of their heart and out of a love for you, we pray that that money would be taken and used as you would have it to be. Father, we pray for your will. We pray for your guidance. We pray for your wisdom in taking care of our expenses here and, uh, and uh, take, just having good stewardship, Lord. Be with our pastor as he comes today and he brings the scriptures to us and, and uh, opens the word of God. We pray that you would give him an extra special blessing, Lord. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye. 
and so great and wondrous, deep and mighty, pure, sublime, coming from the heart of Jesus, just the same through tests of time. He, the pearly gates, will open, so So great and wondrous, all my sins he then forgave. I will sing his praise forever, for his blood is power to save. He, the pearly gates, will open so that I may enter in. Purchase my redemption and forgave me all my sin. In life's even tide of twilight, at his door I'll knock and wait. I shall enter heaven's gate. He, the pearly gates, will open so that I may enter in. For he purchased my redemption and forgave me all my sin. Thank you, gentlemen. Great song, great song. Okay. How many of you grew up in families with brothers and sisters? How many of you, okay, how many of you grew up with a sibling of the same gender? Yeah, quite a few of you, okay. Uh, how many of you experienced sibling rivalry? <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, I can remember growing up, it was just me and my brother. And, uh, and Diane grew up with a brother. And uh, I, I think Diane and her brother, you, you and Danny got along pretty well, except for the time that you both almost got bit by the rattlesnake. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, but I, I remember my brother and I, we pretty much got along. I just knew that he was two years younger than me. And don't make him mad. Oh, man, when my brother got mad, we ran for the hills. <laughs> I, I was good at making him mad once in a while. And I think I've told this years later when we're talking together. He said, you know, you always could get Dad to do anything you wanted him to, you to do. I said, no, 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 I didn't. It wasn't that way. He, well, yeah, it was. Every time you asked for something, Dad did it. And, and he wasn't always that way with me. And I said, you want to know why? Because I knew what Dad was going to say no to, and I never asked for that. <laughs> <laughs> and you always ask for stuff that I could have told you Dad's going to say no, you know? But, uh, you know, brothers and sisters are a wonderful thing. But uh, sometimes there is a little bit of rivalry. And today we're going to talk about two ladies right there. Martha and Mary, they're two wonderful ladies, and it's the tale of two sisters, and uh, if you're familiar with the story, you can turn to Luke chapter 10, we'll look at that in a few moments, chapter 10, and it begins in about the 38th verse. These were two very neat ladies. Jesus came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. 
She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Where was that home? Well, we learned that Jesus would go there a lot. At the, near the end of his ministry, that final week, Mark 11 tells us, he entered Jerusalem, and this is, this is the final week. Mark really takes about a third of his book to tell you about the final week. And he went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went to Bethany with the twelve. John 12 once says, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And most of us know what happened with Lazarus, the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed, raising Lazarus from the dead. And Lazarus was the brother of Martha and Mary. Where was Bethany? It was called Bethany of Judea, and it was on the eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives there to your right, and on the other side would have been Jerusalem. And this is where they lived. We know today that there are tombs there, and they've discovered a tomb that was said to be Lazarus' tomb. And so it's, a, it's a, been a place where pilgrims have gone for a long time to see it. But they're very interesting, and this is just a side thing, but what they've discovered there recently are ossuaries that have the name Lazarus and Martha on it. What's an ossuary? In the late 1800s, there were burial chambers near the village of Bethany that were discovered, and they found ossuaries dating back to the very first century AD. Now, this is what an ossuary looked like. An ossuary was basically an alabaster box about two feet long and about a foot wide and perhaps 15, 16 inches high. And what they would do, they, in the last century B.C. and the first century A.D., this is basically when they were doing this. After the first century, they didn't use them anymore. But what Jews would do in anticipation of the, the resurrection is they would put the body in the grave and would leave it for a year, and it would decompose, and then they would go back and gather the bones up and place them in these ossuaries and then they would place them in a crypt. And the one on the left is a typical ossuary. Some interesting things, though, and discoveries. In 1990, they discovered an ossuary that had the name Joseph, son of Caiaphas. And they have pretty well authenticated this one, that this must have been the son of Caiaphas who condemned Jesus to death. We also found another one you probably have heard about. It. The Discovery Channel had this on TV several years ago another alabaster box with an engraving on it. And what it says is, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And uh, there's been some controversy over this. Not all agree that it was authentic. Uh, there was a man that was put on trial in Israel for forgery, but he was acquitted. So it's still up in the air that this very well may be the alabaster ossuary that held the bones of James, because we know that one of the brothers of, Je of, of Jesus was James. He later became the leader of the church there in Jerusalem and uh, uh, eventually was martyred. So interestingly enough, we found these ossuaries. Now what about Mary, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus? They were close friends of Jesus. It was a close family. Jesus knew them well, and he spent time with them. Martha was probably the oldest. Now, why do we say that? Because when he goes to the house, if you remember, it mentions that it was Martha's house, that she met him. Now, that may simply mean that she was the lady of the house, but it belonged to Lazarus. We don't know. But more than likely, it was Martha's house. Now, if it was Martha's house, then she may have been a widow, and it was left to her. Usually, if it was a family home, it would have gone to Lazarus since he was the one male. But it very well may be Martha, and uh, Martha's husband had died. We, we don't know all the details. The two sisters, though, that we're going to look at in a minute, they were, they were different, but they both loved Jesus just like Lazarus did. Now, the interesting thing is none of them appeared to be married. There isn't any indication that they were married there. But they frequently stayed, Jesus frequently stayed at their home, and he stayed with them in that final week before he went to the cross. Now, here's the interesting thing. As much as we all know about Lazarus, there's not one single statement recorded from Lazarus. 
It's just about Lazarus, his resurrection, and there's a little more in chapter 12 of John. We'll see in a moment. But no words. On the other hand, Mary and Martha, they have a little bit to say, and it's very revealing about them. So let's look at these three this morning. Before we get to Mary and Martha, we need to think about Lazarus. Of course, we know Lazarus. Jesus raised him from the dead. I like to say here, Lazarus is the faith that rises from the dust because he was dead in the tomb four days. He only appears in two chapters, John 11 and John 12. It's the only two places you find him. In John 11, Jesus stands before the grave and he says, Lazarus, come forth. I think I've said this to you that uh, J. Vernon McGee used to say, it's a good thing he said, Lazarus, come forth, because if he hadn't named anybody, they'd all come out of the tomb. <laughs> the other place is in John chapter 12. A lot of times we don't remember this, but a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. The chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. They'd already determined that they needed to get rid of Jesus. Caiaphas said, it's good that one man die for everybody. So we got to get rid of this guy. But they made plans to kill Lazarus as well. Why? For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. Now, Lazarus never says anything, but there's, an, there's a real lesson for us here. Jesus said in John 15, if the world hates you, the, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. And what we're reminded with Lazarus is that he was a walking, living testament to the power of the gospel. And they wanted to execute him just like they were going to do to Jesus. You know, it's not easy being a Christian if you're an authentic one. Somebody once asked a question, if you, somebody discovered you were a Christian, would they be surprised? <laughs> I hope not. Now, I'm not out there looking to be persecuted or executed. But you know, if we're consistent about our faith, then we're going to rub some people wrong. It happened that way with Jesus. It was going to happen that way for Lazarus. Now, let's talk about the two sisters. Let's talk about Martha, first of all. I, I love these two sisters, and I love Martha. Martha, just oh, she's just earthy. I love her. I love her in a Christian way, dear. <laughs> Got to make sure I say that now. But I like to say Martha is faith that stirs up the dust, because she stirred up the dust a little bit. Jesus came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. That's why I say it, it kind of sounds like maybe she, she owned the house. But Martha was distracted. Does that ring a bell for any of us? Do we resonate with that distraction? You know, I mean, distraction's our middle name, I think, at this point in life, you know. I start heading off to go do something, and the next thing I know, I'm just gonna, we were talking to somebody, I was talking about this today, the, the, she said, my wife gets me to do the vacuum cleaning, so I go and get it, and I put the vacuum here, and then I walk out to the garage, and first of all, I don't remember why I walked out here, <laughs> but by the time I walk back in there, what's that doing there? <laughs> we get distracted, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Poor me. Tell her to help me. I, I, this would have been amazing just to hear this. Because we've all said something like that at one time or another. Did you ever say that when you were a kid? I know I did. You know, well, my brother Steve, Dad, he's not doing anything. Well, I don't care. I told you to do this. You know, whatever. Uh, Lord, don't you care? Tell her to get off her duff. Tell her to work. What does Jesus say? Oh, Martha, Martha. And incidentally, anytime Jesus said something twice, remember he frequently would say, verily, verily? Anytime you'd say something twice, listen up, this is important. Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what's better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, I want you to understand something at this point. 
He's not putting her down because she's scurrying about serving. It's just that you don't have quite the proper priority or proper perspective. Don't get on your sister here. In a minute, you're going to see she actually was serving too. But she's really chosen the better part. When, when you throw it all up in the air, the, the really important thing at last is, do you know me? And that's what she's doing. I love, somebody wrote this little poem about Martha, and I, I really think it says where she was at. Maybe it says something that will resonate with you. Oh, Lord of all pots and pans and things, since I've not time to be a saint by doing lovely things or watching late with thee, or dreaming in the dawnlight, or storming heaven's gates. Make me a saint by getting meals and washing up the plates. <laughs> oh, God bless Martha. I love Martha. You've got to have Martha's around, man. Uh, you wouldn't have potlucks. You wouldn't have uh, cookies out there. And all of you ladies that are scurrying around out there. In fact, there are some guys that scurry around sometimes, too. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Well, what about Mary. Well, Mary's kind of a neat lady. I call her faith that rests even in the dust. Every time you ever see Mary, you know what? She's at the feet of Jesus. Every time you, you run into her. First time you run into her, this is where, and what we just read in Luke, when Martha's complaining, well, you know, she's not doing anything. She's, she's just, Lord, make her work. The next time we run into her is when Lazarus has died, and Jesus finally comes to town. Of course, Martha goes running to him first, and, you know, and Mary's back at the house, but then finally she lets Mary know, and Mary comes running to him, throws herself at his feet. Lord, if you had just been here, my brother would have lived. And, of course, Jesus goes on to raise Lazarus. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet will he live. And he that lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And that's the question we all have to answer. The next time you hear about her is in John 12. And it's that wonderful passage where she washes the feet of Jesus. Now, I want you to understand something. There's another passage where Jesus is at a dinner and a sinner woman, which means she was a prostitute, she comes in and washes the feet of Jesus. This is not the same lady. This, this is another time, and the lady in the previous one was not Mary Magdalene either. Somebody in the Middle Ages preached a sermon on that, and everybody thought Mary Magdalene was a prostitute ever after. We're going to talk about Mary Magdalene in a couple of weeks. But this is different. This is a scene where they, it's a banquet in that last week of Jesus' life. And the interesting thing is that Martha is serving and she's never complaining anymore. <laughs> I think she got the message. But, but Mary comes in and it tells us she took an expensive perfume, an alabaster vial of nard, which is extremely expensive. It's worth a whole year's wages. I can't imagine buying perfume that costs a whole year's wages. Some have suggested that that was part, excuse me, part of her dowry. She hadn't married yet. We don't know. But she brought out this expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet. And she wiped his feet. She wiped his feet with her hair. Now, understand something. For a Jewish woman to undo her hair, much less wash somebody's feet, was something you just didn't do but in the most humble way she could possibly show. She wanted to express her love for Jesus. It's interesting whether or not we, that she totally understood what was now coming, because Jesus really says she's preparing me for my burial. If you know the passage, you know that Judas complained about it, because he, he was a thief, and he said, what a waste of money here. But she anointed his feet, and, and it's one of the most beautiful scenes in all of the Bible. That was Mary. Martha had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Mary loved to listen to Jesus. She loved to hear the words of God. Now, here's an interesting, let me take this back for a minute. Because I say Mary wasn't just lazy. You know, you've got to ask the question, well, was Mary just lazy? She just, you know, letting poor Martha have to handle everything? I don't think so. 
because, this is the way it's translated in the NIV. However, in Greek, there is another word in there. It's the word also. Martha had a sister called Mary who also has sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, when you read it like that, Martha had a sister called Mary who also sat at the feet, Lord's feet listening. It makes it sound like uh, Martha sat at his feet too. Thing is, and when Jesus goes on to say, you know, you're, you're worried about too many things, Martha really picks the more important thing. Uh, it doesn't make sense if Martha had been sitting at his feet. No, it ought to read like this. Martha had a sister called Mary who also sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. In other words, the also means she'd been in the kitchen helping out too. But she came to the place where he said, okay, you know, enough is ready for dinner. Now, I want to go out and listen to what Jesus said, which is really in some ways maybe what Martha should have done too. You know, sometimes we get so into what we're doing that we forget what's more important, not that what you're doing isn't significant, but I got a feeling that's what it happened with Martha. She just gets caught up in it. She gets distracted. But, but Mary keeps a balance. And there comes a point where she says, OK, Martha, I think we're ready for dinner. And uh, I, I want to I spend a few moments out there with Jesus. I want to hear what he's got to say. I think that's what was going on here. So it's the tale of two sisters. And the question is, which one was right? Maybe even the more important question, <laughs> which one are you? So in these final moments, let, let me just talk about this for a minute. You, know, you got Martha, who's, who we always say Martha's the servant. She's scurrying around, fixing dinner, doing all these things. Jesus said, you're distracted by so much. And then you, you got Mary, devoted Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Well, which is right? Well, think about this for a minute. James chapter 2, verse 14. James, incidentally, he's the brother of Jesus and later comes to faith and wrote this epistle. James says, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Doesn't mean anything. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. He's, he's making a point here because evidently there were some people in his day, you know, that all they did was, uh, if we could put it in our contemporary terms, all they did is come to church on Sunday, maybe put their little offering in the plate and go home, and on Monday you wouldn't know any difference from, from the next pagan that lived on the street. He says, no, no, no. Faith that's real, there'll be deeds. There'll be proof of it. You'll see it in the way that they live. And for Martha, the outworking of her faith was just to serve Jesus and to, to minister hospitality and, and lavish her love on him by, by making a nice meal. Now, the thing with Martha is she was so into that that she wasn't sensitive to the bigger picture. Because by this time, all Jesus wanted was a little quiet and just enough to nourish himself because Friday's coming. Friday's coming. And it seems that Mary understood that better. Sometimes we can get so wrapped up in our service that we haven't balanced our life also with understanding the Lord's will for my life. What's important to him? What about the beauty of the Lord? Well, let's go on for a minute. Let's talk about Mary. And she loved sitting at the feet of Jesus. We could say she loved Bible study. We could put it that way today. She loved reading her Bible in the morning. She loved listening to the words of God. Uh, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. She understood that, that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. She, she intuitively understood that. That's what I think you see in this woman. And Paul reminds us in 2 Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A what? A workman who doesn't need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. I like the way the new King James puts it. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. To, to endeavor to be alone with Jesus, to understand the word of God, to study it and read it, that's a work too. 
It's a work of love. We need to have a balance. <laughs> I remember when I was at teaching seminary, um, I used to have some guys in the class. It, it, there are a lot of guys who go off to seminary <laughs> and they think they've had the call of God. They haven't. And they don't have the first idea about what's, what's really right. And I, they, I listen to these guys sometimes and, and all they do after class is go home and, and they just spend the whole day studying and reading God's word and their poor wife is working her, you know, working like crazy eight, ten hours a day putting hubby through school and this guy doesn't even help do the dishes or nothing. And then they wonder why he goes in the ministry and within a few years they're divorced. It's because he didn't get it. There are people like that out there. We balance it. With our devotion to God and our, our devotion to serving others. 2 Timothy 3.16, you know the scripture, all scriptures, God breathe, profitable teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. But the next verse, listen to this. So the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for what? For good work. Studying the scriptures prepares us to serve also. There's the balance. Charles Wesley wrote a wonderful hymn years ago. He said, faithful to my Lord's commands, I still would choose the better part. Serve with careful Martha's hands and loving Mary's heart. They're both important. And they both need to be typical of us. Yes, yeah, some of us are going to maybe be more the, more the servant, and the other may be a little more, you know, the devotional person. We're not all the same. But both are important. The danger, however, of motion without devotion, the tyranny of the urgent will steal the joyfulness of his presence. We'll always think, oh, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. There, and, I, you know, and I'm sure you know this. But one thing I've found is the devil will always give me something that seems urgent. Oh, I've got to go take care of this just before I'm going to open my Bible and spend some time reading it. Somebody once said, the anointment is worth the appointment. We have to have that time alone. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me or abides in me, I in him, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can't do anything. And we pray, Paul wrote, that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, what? Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. You see, it's, it's serving and knowing. They go together. I think Peter really learned this. Do you remember there in the Garden of Eden? I mean, not Garden of Eden, but Garden of Gethsemane, when those guys come out to, to arrest Jesus, and Peter pulls out his sword and lops off the ear of one of the guys that come, and Jesus says, put that sword away, don't you know? And in, in just a moment, I could call 12 legions of angels. P Peter didn't get it. Later on, he did, because he wrote one of the last things he wrote, probably not long before he died. He was martyred in Rome. He said, my prayer is this, that you would grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he says grow in the grace, what he means is God's uh, providing the ability for you to serve and to do things for him and in the knowledge of our Lord. You need both. Unless we meet with Christ privately, we're going to be of little use to him publicly. That's the thing you take away from this wonderful story of Mary and Martha. And I hope today that each of us can celebrate the person that God has made you. Don't ever look at other people and say, oh, I wish I was like them. <laughs> As a pastor, sometimes I hear people say that about people, and I, I, just, I just know some things, and I say, oh, you don't know. <laughs> you be who you are. We always think everybody else is better than we are. No, no, no. Learn to celebrate who God made you. God's been, you know, and we're all at a stage in life where God has been shaping us for quite a long time. Sometimes the shape is getting out a little out of control, but, uh, but he has. From the moment you were born, from the moment you came into this world, even before you were born, God has sovereign plans for you and for me. And we go through life yeah, we get pinged on, we get dinged on, we make mistakes. But God causes all things to work together for good.
for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. And so he's shaping you and he's shaping me. Some of you can do things that I, I wouldn't try or I shouldn't try. <laughs> Diane will tell you, you don't want to get me around the toilet. I, I, she says, you have an engineering degree. You can't even fix a toilet. <laughs> we still talk about the toilet that I was trying to repair years ago, and I had a monkey wrench inside, and I went, bang, and I knocked out the whole back of the toilet, and water was all everywhere, you know. <laughs> I don't have the gift of plumbing. <laughs> even though my daughter calls me the other night from Los Angeles and says, Dad, I, I need your help. What do I do here? So it meant that I had to go in the bathroom, undo the, the toilet bowl, get my hands down in there, take a picture of it, and show her what needs to be done. Oh, oh what sacrifice we make for our children, even when they're adults. <laughs> Others of you would say, I wouldn't dare get up here behind this pulpit. It would, you're, you're, they tell me public speaking is the number one thing that people most fear, next to going to the dentist. Uh, well, we all have our gifts and abilities, but do it to the glory of God. And, and never, never, never forget, don't let your motion leave out your devotion. You've got to have time every day with the Lord. Read his word. There's all kinds of different ways you know, we make available to you the daily bread. That's a wonderful little way to do it. The one-year Bible is another wonderful way to do it. There are so many different ways that we can just simply read through the scriptures and, and take them in. And then we go along and we serve God to the glory of God with the abilities that he's given us. Well, I'm going to close the service now and Karen's going to come and lead us the song. I don't remember what the song is now. <laughs> That's a pretty good song. Oh, Jesus, I have promised. What are you going to promise him today? <laughs> Lord, I'm going to promise you because you came into this world and saved me from my sins. I promise that I will do my best to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand. Let's sing that song together. Good to be with all of you today, and the Lord bless you. I'm going to ask if uh, Mike Cox will come and lead us in prayer. And uh, hey, if you're here today for the first time, hang around. There's some refreshments out there. We'd love to get to meet you. I'd love to get to say hi to you. But it's wonderful to have each and every one of you here today. God bless. Let's bow for prayer. Oh, gracious God, you've brought us to this place today. you brought us here to encourage us, to uplift us, to draw us into a fellowship with you. But you have also told us that you have assignments for us, that as we have come to learn and to hear, that we are also to go forth and make a difference in the world. You have left, left us with a legacy, a legacy of knowing Christ and of seeing the joy and the blessings that he brought to others, and that you use us to bring those blessings and joys to others. For truly, dear Father, you are a God who remembers us 
every hour of every day, and that you make a difference in our lives. Guide us as we go forth, that we may be your people in a world who so desperately needs to see your love and see your grace. Guide us as we go forth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.